let's turn it over to the first speaker, who is Kevin Walsh. Kevin is a co-investigator on the OSIRIS-REx mission and is based out of the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Kevin will be talking about OSIRIS-REx at Bennu, time to collect a sample. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, am I coming through and sharing well? Yes, you are. Uh, you just put full screen, that would. Great, perfect. Okay, thanks for the introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to get to talk about OSIRIS-REx and the exciting times we've been having at our target asteroid, near Earth asteroid Bennu. A reminder, OSIRIS-REx is one of NASA's New Frontiers uh, space exploration missions. This is an asteroid sample return mission with a fundamental primary goal of returning a pristine sample from near-Earth asteroid Bennu. Near -Earth asteroid Bennu. Uh, the requirement is 60 grams of sample to come back. Along the way, and to facilitate the sampling, we get to do all sorts of really exciting science uh, related to understanding the, the connections between meteoritics and um, and the astronomy of asteroids for these volatile rich and low albedo uh, targets. We get to understand the geology and evolution of small roll pile asteroids, which fundamentally is gonna give us context for the sample that we get back to Earth. So I'm gonna focus on this talk uh, eventually about the attempt to sample that's coming up and all of the processes that go into that. But I did wanna make sure to highlight some of the really exciting science that we've been able to do with our time at Bennu. So we arrived at Bennu um, over a year ago in December of 2018. We've been surveying the asteroid ever since. And from that, uh, we made a lot of really exciting discoveries. This is just a really small subset. So there's recently, just a few months ago, a paper by Jamie Malaro in Nature Communications, uh, observing and detailing and, and actually mapping uh, cracks in boulders and foliation surfaces in boulders um, where she makes a very strong claim that we're observing the rock breakdown process on Bennu in an atmosphereless, in an environment with no atmosphere, strictly due to thermal, thermal effects and diurnal cycling of, of temperature at the surfaces of these boulders. We made an absolutely stunning global shape model of the asteroid using the laser altimeter supplied by the Canadian Space Agency. The science from this has been bountiful and there's gonna be a paper, um, a paper has been submitted to Science Advances where they use this information to detail um, differences in the two hemispheres of our target body, but is also incredibly useful for getting detailed um, digital terrain maps of the potential sample sites. And finally, one of the really big surprises when we got to Bennu is that it's actually active. It's releasing particles uh, into space. Uh, some stay on very, uh, close orbits, but others are being ejected off the surface never to return. So this was an, a really fun surprise, and there was a paper in Science um, last summer by the PI Dante Loretta. So from all of these scientific studies, uh, one really big conclusion is that Bennu is absolutely the target we had hoped for. We'd hoped to get to a near-Earth asteroid that would be um, something similar to a meteorite, like a a CM carbonaceous chondrite, something that would be rich with hydrated uh, minerals. And that's exactly what we found. And this was presented in uh, Nature Astronomy by Vicki Hamilton. And the plot just shows uh, the spectral reflectance as a function of wavelength for Bennu up there on the top in black compared with a bunch of really primitive um, low albedo carbonaceous chondrite meteorites um, that are rich in water bearing clay minerals. Exactly what we want. We see this across the entire surface. So we're really expecting that no matter where we choose to sample, we're going to be getting the material that we were, we were looking for. Now, Bennu did absolutely surprise us. And in some ways that have had to change the way uh, we're thinking about, or we were thinking about our sampling strategy. So fundamentally, the asteroid was far more rough and rocky than expected. Our expectations had been built on uh, thermal observations uh, from ground-based, instrumentation, and also uh, radar observations. And those gave us an, an impression that it would be as rocky or less rocky than asteroid Itacaba, which had very large uh, ponds of fine grains across the surface. And in this global revolving image, there aren't really apparent any large ponds of fine grains. And to assure you that we weren't just zoomed too far out, we can zoom way in on Bennu, 
And here are some images, and you can see the scale bar in the upper left showing only five meters across. And here's another one with a similar scale bar. And another one with a similar scale bar. Bennu is a rubble pile in the truest sense of the word. And there's an absolute dearth of ponds of fine grains and an absolute abundance of meter sized and larger boulders. Now this is really important for us because of the restrictions of our sampling mechanism. And so let's watch an animation of how the, the sampling attempt is meant to go for OSIRIS-REx. So that's our main spacecraft that extends a three meter long arm from the, the bus of the spacecraft. At the end of it is a 32 centimeter diameter um, ring, an annulus that is pressed into the surface at 10 centimeters per second. Uh, after the spacecraft detects that contact has been made, it blows high pressure gas into the surface and then only makes contact for a few seconds before we blow our back away jets and fly away. And to zoom in on the actual sampling process, this is a, a cutaway of the sampling head. Uh, the outer diameter is 32 centimeters. The inner diameter is only 21 centimeters. And when particles are redirected by this high pressure gas, they go through that red mylar flap, which is only two centimeters. And then they're captured in that ring, a, a metal mesh ring around the outside of the canister. So the restrictions here are that we need to avoid things that are 21 centimeters or larger because they could obscure the entire head. And we have to target particles that are two centimeters or smaller so that they can go through the mechanism and get captured. Anything larger than that likely won't get captured. So Bennu presented us with two really big challenges. There were no regions on the surface that were safe, that were as large as what we had planned for. We had planned for a diameter 50 meter deliverability region. And that is, we asked the, the engineers to build a spacecraft that could uh, be navigated to a region 50 meters across uh, using LIDAR based navigation. And that there is absolutely no place on this asteroid that, that would accommodate that. So on the engineering and technical side, we have moved to a natural feature tracking based navigation. So this required developing a bunch of geologic features um, that could be unambiguously tracked optically by the spacecraft for navigation. This could be much more accurate than using the LIDAR based navigation that we had planned on. This required going back and doing, uh, changing a bunch of observational campaigns so that we could actually develop and find these features around all the candidate sample sites. And we had to change some of the software on the, on the spacecraft uh, to be able to utilize this technology. Doing so brought the deliverability region from that diameter 50 meter uh, size ellipse down to something closer to seven or eight meters across. So it was a huge development that absolutely increased the number of potential sample sites on the surface. It also allows for a hazard map so that the spacecraft can trigger a back away burn and wave off a sampling attempt if it detects that it's headed towards uh, what we have predetermined is a dangerous spot on the surface. So that was on the technical and engineering side. On the science side, uh, the regular scientists were tasked with initially finding the best spots on the surface for our sampling mechanism. Where's the largest collection of two centimeter and smaller grains to optimize the total mass that we could collect. And when we saw the surface, we, we realized that we would have to, in fact, reverse this question. Uh, and we approached things in a different way. And we said, where can we positively identify particles that we cannot ingest? Let's map those across the surface and avoid those spots and find the, the, the minimum using that metric. So we cultivated regions of interest using a bunch of approaches, uh, using machine learning and citizen science platform. We started with 50 regions that were interesting. In the end, we boiled it down to four uh, really exciting regions. They're, they're different flavors of small craters on the surface. Those seem to be the smoothest um, and most devoid of, of really large particles. In the upper left is our prime sample site. It's a 23 meter crater in the Northern latitudes. It's one of the darkest and reddest craters on the surface, which gives us hope that it's full of uh, of really primitive and, and uh, unaltered material that we're really targeting. 
Uh, it is worth noting that you can see in that rotating image, there is a 10 meter boulder that is seven meters tall sitting on the edge of the crater. The backup site is Osprey in the upper right. It's a 20 meter crater. Um, it has more larger particles that could frustrate sampling. So that's why it's the backup. And it has a three meter crater sitting at the 12 o'clock part of the crater, which is also a little bit worrisome. So in the end, the- hey, Kevin, uh, the ding did not work. So if you could finish up for the next slide, that'd be great. Okay. I will hurry through these. Um, so this is the, the image of the sampling site given for scale roughly the three sigma deliverability region uh, within the site. And the red pixels are those that would be considered hazardous and could potentially uh, trigger a back away burn and a wave off from a sampling attempt. And for scale, that is roughly the size of the spacecraft with the extended solar panels sitting in the middle of the crater. So this is just uh, to visualize how tight of a spot we're trying to get the spacecraft into. We have two rehearsals, uh, one complete and one upcoming before we tried to tag in our sample in October of 2020. The first rehearsal was in April and that's what this video is of. And that boulder that we are descending towards and then backing away from is that seven meter tall boulder. Uh, we will go to 40 meters from the surface in August before we attempt a sample in October. And so with that, my conclusions are really straightforward. Uh, Bennu, this near-Earth asteroid, has absolutely supplied all of those, the exciting scientific discoveries that we expect when exploring a new world. And choosing a site um, required technical challenges that, that, that really pushed on engineers and scientists to come together to solve some difficult problems uh, to find a spot that we could sample. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, apologies that the ding did not work. <laughs> um, but any questions from the audience? We have time for just one quick question if you want to enter the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. And if not, uh, we do have a discussion session built in after this session. So Kevin, if you, could, you and the other speakers can stick around after the six talks are concluded, uh, maybe the audience will have time to think of a question for you during that discussion period.